Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yadihi allahu fala mudilla la wa man yudlilhu fala hadiya la. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All praise be to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray and whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is none except Allah, the one who has no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is Allah's servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O ye who believe be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. Ya ayyuhal nas uttaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisa'a wa attaqu Allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna Allah kana alaykum raqiba O humanity be mindful of your creator be mindful of your creator who created you from a single soul and from that single soul created its mate and through both Allah spread countless men and women and be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah in whose name you appeal to one another and honor your ties of kinship. Surely Allah is ever watchful over you. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullah wa qoolu qawlan sadeeda yuslih lakum a'amalakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wa man yuta'illaha wa rasooluhu faqad faza fawzan azeema. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah and say what is right. Allah will bless your good deeds for you and will forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and the messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great triumph. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasulli ah wa yasulli amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Bismillah. In the name of Allah we begin. So today my topic of this khutbah was God meeting you where you are or faith meeting you where you are. So many of us know of the image of the Statue of Liberty. It's very common in American media. Some of us may have even seen it if we went to New York. A uh, very popular image and it bears the words of a 19th century poem inscripted on it that says, give me your tired, give me your poor, give me your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. This was a message that is and was intended for those coming from other nations and parts of the world, sending a message to them that a promise of freedom awaits them, a promise of rest awaits them, a promise of comfort awaits them, a better life awaits them. But we know in this nation and for many of us, especially those who are most marginalized, especially in the black and brown communities, especially those who are on the peripheries of our society, the experience has been anything but restful. There's high cost of medicine, there's social inequities, there's institutional racism, there's income inequality, so on and so forth. There's gender pay gaps. There's all this stuff that we could go, a litany of reasons why this experience in this land for many of us is not what it promises to be for everybody. Rather, as I mentioned that in America or in any country, the uh, religion of Allah, the belief in Allah, the faith of the Prophet وسلم, is what we can maybe think of as a promise that, that can live up to these things. These things that are being promised, no one nation, no one country, no one tangible thing uh, in our world, no one worldly thing can live up to these lofty expectations of giving rest, giving comfort, giving a, uh, a pass to everybody, giving an upliftment to everybody. None of these things can deliver on that promise except, except the religion of Allah except the faith 
of the Prophet Sallallahu and the faith that is in Allah. So when we think about the Statue of Liberty, we think about that maybe being on the other side where this message is given of, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free instead of on the backside, there being any kind of nation or worldly entity that's there, you have the faith of Allah. You have the comfort of Allah. You have the faith and the religion of God that is there, that lives up to and can live up to one that gives comfort, that gives rest, to those who have the least and wherever they may be. The promise that is etched on the Statue of Liberty is one that does not, that should not discriminate for anybody, whether they are wealthy uh, people coming in and migrating to this country or whether they are refugees or asylum seekers, that principle should be there for everybody. But unfortunately it's not. However, faith as it is, faith in its substance, is one that meets people where they are and delivers on that promise without any caveats. Now, how that faith is played out in certain religious communities and mosques and other spaces of faith and spaces in religious communities, it may, it may not exactly seem that way. For some people, it may be an inequitable experience. It may be a discriminatory experience. But when we dig a little bit deeper, we find that faith, in fact, is substantively at its root, as the message of God, one that does not discriminate, regardless of who we are, where we might be coming from. We might be coming from a land of sin. We might be coming from uh, a place of uh, without belief in God. We might be coming from uh, just, you know, the same part of that country just coming back. We might have been born there. We might have left, and now we're coming back. Wherever we might come, Allah and the messenger of Allah and the religion of Allah and the faith in Allah is there waiting for us, saying, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. It's reminiscent of a verse in the Gospel of Matthew in the Bible that uh, Jesus relates, come to me, all you who are burdened and weary, and I will give you rest. This idea is that God will meet us where we are, especially when we are worn out, especially if we've gone through the ringer of life and we're coming back, that wherever we might be, God will be there. When we are ready or when we might not expect it, it's not an uncommon thing for God to find us wherever we may be, are, wherever we may be. So we know that Musa salam, was tending to some sheep, minding his own business, and God encountered him, calling him and revealing himself. We know that the Prophet ﷺ was just meditating, doing what he was doing on any other day that year or prior and encountered the revelation. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was just minding her own business. She might have just been in the temple praying. She might have just been at home, just taking care of the things at home. And she encountered the revelatory experience and the angel. But there are others as well who may not have this romanticized encounter. Jonah, Yunus alayhi salam, was in the belly of a whale. Ayub, Job, was struck with poverty and disease. Yusuf, or Joseph alayhi salam, was at the bottom of a well and also in prison. Hagar, or Hajar, our mother, uh, wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam, was in the desert. In the desert, in the wilderness, with nothing around with just her child, not a source of water, and she encountered God there. In our society we're, uh, that, the, that we're in and the communities that we're in, we oftentimes may be made to feel that our mistakes define us, that the worst things that we can do or the negative things that we can do that might not totally line up with our faith are what define us, that we, when we do those things, we're not worthy of redemption, that ultimately God is displeased with us or hates us, People might judge us by the clothes that we wear. They might look at us by the cars that we drive or the statuses that we have, the tattoos that we might bear, the scars that we might have. And they might not give us an opportunity to be able to prove ourselves as something more than just what's on the superficial. Instead, by them doing that, they create a distance not only between us and them, but they create a distance between us and ourselves and our perception of ourselves, as well as us and our faith and our connection to God. This is the power that 
the negative power that can happen when we create the separation, when we don't meet people where they are at, we create this distance that might not ever be able to be recovered. And it's in times like these, and it's moments like these, places like these, where we remember who our Prophet Sallallahu was, what Islam was that he had taught, and what Allah has to offer, and what Allah is, and who Allah is in this space, and invited, and who the Prophet Sallallahu invited us to worship as well. So we know that the state of the Sahaba before Islam was one that was not exactly an ideal situation. Allah sent a messenger not to a city of angels. Allah sent a messenger to a place that needed it most and probably a lot more so than uh, any other place at that time. And uh, this divine intercession was something that was necessitated, not because everybody was doing every single thing right, but because these folks were so far gone that they needed help to get back to the right path, but not in a way that just made what they were doing insignificant, not in a way that just was a theological revolution, that they were worshiping uh, different gods, and now this is the biggest thing that came out, that they changed their faith, but the fact that they transformed. Think about the Sahaba. These were people who were mostly adults. They had lived their full lives up to that point. They were 30, they were 40, they were 50, and you know a mix of both. You had kids, you had folks who were very elderly, and Ask yourself again, would a prophet come to a place where there are all these angels or there's all these people who are doing everything exactly right? No, these people are so gone that I mentioned that as an example uh, needed to be made of them and through them for us, not simply just to show us what theologically Islam is, but to show us the power that Islam possesses. Islam was not just a theological revolution. Islam was a psychological revolution. Islam was a social revolution. Islam turned things on its head that were not originally thought of as wrong. Islam uh, undid some of the, so the social inequities. Islam taught against what was being taught in terms of exploitation. Islam balanced not just the faith that was there. Islam balanced how people treated, with, uh, treated one another. We have examples uh, rich examples of transformations. We have people who were who could not leave alcohol or any of these other substances becoming sober and leading the prayer. We have people who were uh, overcome with anger time and time again and tribal instincts that became patient and became teachers. We, became, we have those who were absolutely hating and opposed to Islam who became its biggest proponents and defenders. Islam was not an overnight change of life. Islam was a gradual, radical transformation that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gradually taught and gradually taught for over 23 years. 23 years, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sowed the seed, even though people rejected him, pushed back, did all these things. For 23 years, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to work and taught the religion is easy and the religion is ease. And Think about now when we practice Islam, when we teach Islam, when we tell people how they can properly be a Muslim, we compile 23 years of a psychological, emotional, social revolution and teaching, compile it into a six or five chapter book and tell people this is how you need to be without meeting them where they are. That if they're still drinking by the time we give them this book and they finish it, that they're not worthy of being a Muslim. That uh, if they still do certain things that Islam forbids, that by the end of it, they're not a Muslim. We don't think about how Islam went. Psychologically it took 16 years to outlaw alcohol. If alcohol was absolutely off the table, the Prophet and, uh, in, in, in the Quran would outlaw it immediately and it would be ceased. But it, Islam and the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the human condition that when you wean off of something that people are addicted to, when you wean off of something that people depend on, you have to replace it. You have to taper off of it gradually. Islam, when it was revealed, understood the psychological condition of the people who were, it was being revealed to, the people who at that time were probably the worst that you could think of. And yet Islam brought such a compassionate and careful approach to them. Yet we don't afford that same thing to us and to the people around us, the people in our communities. Ask yourselves why. 
You have the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who's drunk, who came to the mosque time and time again and would disrupt people in their prayer while he was intoxicated and how the people wanted to throw him out and said, no, you know, you don't belong here because you're drinking. Like you, you don't belong, you're drunk, get out of here. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, never, never let him leave that mosque. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, leave your bottle at home, leave your bottle uh, at the door of the mosque, leave your bottle, your flask at the corner, leave your bottle at home. And rather than kicking that person out, being saying that, hey, until you get sober, until you stop drinking, you can't come to the mosque. The Prophet ﷺ met that person where he was, knew that he was addicted to the substance, gave him easy, tangible things to do, regardless of what the companions were saying. And the person came back eventually and said, I've given up my, my alcohol, subhanAllah. The Prophet Sallallahu sees a, a person urinating in the corner of his masjid and the Sahaba rush to him with swords up and say, hey man, this ain't, this ain't cool, what are you doing? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, stop, let him finish. Let him finish and then we'll tell him. And when the man finished, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells him that, hey, you know, this is a place of worship. This is a house of God. We don't, we don't do that here. The way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approached him, the, the, the cautiousness, the care, the person became a Muslim. But also just look at the, the intellect of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the aqal of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where when he was, he was saying, don't let him finish. Imagine someone is doing that in the corner of your mosque and you pull that person to the back and imagine what happens when they turn around and they're still in the process of, of doing that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew this, but think about in our mosques where somebody accidentally brings their shoes on the carpet. Somebody accidentally does something or you know, uh, may make a slight mistake or a slight error. They might not know any better. Imagine how many people may rush to that person and, and, and get ready to throw that person out. This level of compassion is not there. Imagine somebody urinating in the corner of the mosque, just coming in, not knowing any better. You know, we would be, we would call security or call police and say, we need to get this guy out of here. We'd probably file a lawsuit too. But look at the Prophet's approach. Islam is not a sprint as it's often made to be, that you need to memorize all this. You need to do all this, do it all by this time. You know, you need to Pull this all in uh, before or you're not a good Muslim. Islam is a marathon. It was a marathon for those who it was revealed to who were adults, 40, 50 year olds, 60 year olds, learning little by little. Yet we hold their faith up as the best of us. We hold their faith up as exemplary. Yet we don't think about how they learned and how it took such a long time for them to be able to learn this faith. When, when one person we know may not do it in a few days or a month or a year, we think that person's slow. We don't lift up the patience that Islam came with, that Islam didn't come without impatience. Islam didn't say, okay, by tomorrow, you all need to be doing this, and then uh, it, we, we will be good. Islam came and met people where they were. It took three or four years or so for Islam's uh, da'wah to go public, for the message to go public, before it was just small chit-chat here. There's been small teachings. It was bringing family, families together. It was a closed circle, teaching people what Islam was. If it was all about the moment, Islam would have gone out uh, all at once. But again, knowing the condition of the people, Prophet Sallallahu and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knew the condition of this people. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala guided the Prophet Sallallahu to teach it in such a way, teach this religion in such a way that was reflective of the needs of that society. But do we do the same for our society? You also have the story of the man who wished to commit zina and came to the Prophet ﷺ. And you can recognize some of the companions' reactions around the Prophet ﷺ. And think about where, where you might see folks like this. That a young man comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, O Messenger of Allah, give me the permission to commit zina. Give me the permission to commit adultery. And the people turn to rebuke him and say, quiet, like, shut up. Like, what are you, what are you saying? Why, why are you saying that? You're, you're ridiculous. And so the Prophet ﷺ tells them to be quiet. And says, come here, come here, come here, just sit down. He doesn't, he doesn't really kill him. He says, hey, look at this guy. This guy doesn't know anything. Like, what, what, what's he asking for? You know how we might poke fun at someone who might not know any better. Prophet Sallallahu met him where he was. He said, hey, come, sit down. He sits right, right across the Prophet Sallallahu And he, line by line, asks this person rhetorically, you know, would you like that to be, to happen to your mother? Would you like that? for your sister, for your aunt, for your daughter. And it goes to all the relations that one can have to a female from a familial side, all the way down to their aunts. And the, the man said, 
I, I wouldn't like this this for myself and I wouldn't like it for anybody. And the Prophet when each time he asked him, the man would respond, no, I wouldn't like it. Um, and the Prophet responded as well that people wouldn't like that either. That if you're talking about that for your mom and you don't like that, imagine how your brothers feel or your sisters feel. And after the Prophet gives him this lesson, the Prophet puts his hand on this man. He puts his hand on the man that people said quiet and wanted to get rid of. He puts his hand on him and says, Allah, forgive his sins. Forgive his sins, purify his heart and guide his chastity or guard his chastity. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, it's related that the man never again inclined to anything sinful. And the Prophet ﷺ said, hate what Allah has hated or dislike what Allah has disliked and love for your sibling, your brother, your sister, what you love for yourself. The Prophet ﷺ met this person where he was. Where he was, everybody around him was ready to kick him out. The Prophet ﷺ knew exactly where he was, met him there, helped him get to where he needed to go. We see how not just in theory or in statement, the Prophet ﷺ used care, used patience and understanding to meet people where they were, to help them get where they needed to go without belittling them, without ridiculing them, without hurting them or making them feel bad. We know the Prophet ﷺ met people who were marginalized and put on the peripheries of society, met them and asked them to take him wherever they wanted. There's a story of the a woman who had mental illness. It was described that this person had some kind of mental illness. Imagine now we talk about how people with mental illness are stigmatized. Imagine back then where you had people saying that this, this woman has completely gone crazy. Maybe a jinn has possessed her. Maybe something has happened. She's obviously not right. And she comes to the Prophet and says, I need to speak with you. And he tells her, pick any corner of this, of this city, pick any place in the, in the alley or wherever it may be, and I'll meet you there. And setting this example that even those who we may call crazy or we may you know, kind of look at odd ways or just laugh at behind their backs are the same people the Prophet would have walked shoulder to shoulder with to where they need to go. Sit with them, give them the time of day, be present with them and help them uh, alongside when we might shut them out. As brothers and sisters in Islam, we can live off of one basic principle. Love for others what you love for yourself. We need to call ourselves to not just be those individuals that are superficially Muslim here, but we need to be one another's statue of liberty for this faith. We need to send the message authentically, come together, whether you're tired, come together, whether you're poor, that you're huddled all together, weary, burdened, wherever you might be, stressed, put, you know, just turning back to faith, whether you have no faith, whether you are coming to Islam for the first time or the second time or never before, that we, we are to each other sources and beacons of hope that call to one another to be comforted, to be, uh, to be informed that what lies behind us here is that Darus Salaam, is that abode of peace, and that in it, Allah provides peace and rest that has no prerequisites, that has no basic requirements that or barriers that might limit the, the peace and the tranquility for all, that is free and open to all regardless of who you are, what you've done, or where you come from, or how much faith you have or how little it has. Inshallah, in the closing of this khutbah, We'll ask, uh, we'll, we'll actually, we'll, we'll, we'll relate some hadith or traditions of the Prophet ﷺ for us to keep in mind as we're going. And we ask Allah to enable us to be one another's statues of liberty, calling each other authentically, but also realizing that uh, as these statues of liberty, as these, these entities that are calling people, we, we meet people where they are. We don't discriminate anybody regardless of what their differences or what they may look like, if they don't look like us, if they don't pray like us, if they don't do anything like us, that we meet them where Allah and the Prophet ﷺ met them before, and the Prophet ﷺ would meet them again, inshallah. I say these words of mine, and I ask Allah for forgiveness. We, we lift up a couple of hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that help us maybe become those, those uh, torch bearers of the message of Islam, the authentic message of Islam, uh, the Islam that is for all and not just for some. First and foremost of the maxim the Prophet ﷺ taught, do not harm and don't reciprocate harm. So in any action that we do, don't harm anyone. 
even if you are uh, teaching the faith, you can teach the faith in a way that harms somebody. If you're helping to uh, educate somebody about the faith or trying to teach them a certain way, you there's a potential to harm them. You operate in a way that doesn't harm, meets them where they're at. The second is a hadith that is taught to students beginning the uh, the quest for knowledge, beginning on their studies of knowledge, especially in memorization of the hadith that show mercy to those on earth and the one who will who is in heaven will show mercy to you. The Quran reminds us that as Muslims in Surah Ali Imran, we are the best people raised for the good of humanity. We enjoin what is right and we forbid what is wrong, but we call people to the faith. We call one another to the faith. We are uh, there for each other. And we ask Allah to not just uh, enable us to be individuals that are uh, torchbearers of mercy, but individuals that don't harm one another, that individuals that don't hurt one another, and that we may be shown mercy as well as we uh, help make our faith more accessible for those who have been harmed by other people in this faith, who've been excluded, who've been marginalized. We ask Allah to allow us to be the openers of the gates for this bounty and to not shut this, uh, these gates for anybody. We ask Allah to enable us to continue in the footsteps of our caregiving, nurturing, patient, and loving Prophet Sallallahu and to be able to not just be these best people that are merciful, harmless, God conscious, but to be people with patience for each other and know that our faith requires the utmost care and patience that we are not just delivery folks bringing a package and saying, here's Islam, now you're on your own. We are those teachers, we are those chaplains, we are those counselors, we are those sojourners that sit with one another. We are siblings to one another. We are parents to each other. We are loved ones to each other. And we sit with each other and we process this together. We don't just leave someone away after we bring them such a beautiful gift and uh, we don't we don't disregard them for if they're different, if they look different, they sound different, if they're maybe not as spiritual as us or come across as faithful as us, but we meet them where they're at and we help them get where they themselves want to go and where they need to go and where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, advise and, the, and Allah SWT advise where they need to go. And we, we are there alongside them every step of the way that we're not just like this for each other, but we're also like this for ourselves. The faith can be overwhelming. The religion can get overwhelming, and the Prophet ﷺ has advised that uh, to the, the religion can become overwhelming, but that to remember it is a religion of ease, to take it in, in a slow and measured manner as it was revealed, and to, to leave that which overwhelms us in a way that allows us to embrace it in a more appreciative and loving manner. May Allah allow us to be as such to be the statues, not of liberty, not of justice or of freedom or these one single ideals, but be statues of the faith of, the, uh, of Islam, be statues and callers and uh, welcomers of the religion of Allah, the faith of Allah in which you have love, justice, mercy, compassion, and justice for everybody, regardless of where they come. And we ask that Allah allow us to be as such not just in this moment, but for the rest of our lives and to allow us to enable others to be as such. Inshallah, Ami. Rabbana taqabbal minna, inna ka anta samiu al-alim. Our Lord, accept from us the service for thou art all hearing, all knowing. Jum'a Mubarak, everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I pray that this Friday receives you and your family and your loved ones well. And inshallah, I pray that you have a blessed weekend. Until next time, inshallah, wa akhra wa da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.